Let's All start right. it here. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Big Challenges in Data Modeling, Staying Relevant and Valued as the Data Modeler, an interview with Alex Sharp. And this series is moderated by the esteemed Karen Lopez. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag BCDmodeling, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Today, we have a single interviewee, the infamous Alex Sharp. Alec has managed his consulting and education business, Claritech Systems Consulting Limited, for close to 30 years. Serving clients from Ireland to India and Washington to Wellington, Alec's expertise includes facilitation, business analytics, business process improvement, and, of course, data management. In addition to his consulting practice, he conducts top-rated workshops and conference presentations on these, global, these topics globally. Alec is the author of Working Workflow Modeling, Second Edition, Architect House 2008, which is widely used as a consulting guide and university text and is a bestseller in the field. And of course, let me introduce our esteemed moderator, Karen Lopez. Karen is a senior project manager and architect of Info Advisors. She has 20 plus years of experience in project and data management on large multi project programs. Karen specializes in the practical application of data management principles. She is a frequent speaker, blogger, and panelist on data quality, data governance, logical and physical data modeling, data compliance, development methodologies, and social issues in computing. She is an active user on social media and has been named one of the top three technology influencers by IBM Kitta and one of the top 17 women in information management by Information Management Magazine. She is a Microsoft SQL Server MVP specializing in data modeling and database design. She's an advisor to the DAMA International Board and a member of the advisory board of Zachman International. We meet both Karen and Alec in person at this year's Enterprise Data World 2014 Conference and Expo in Austin, Texas. And you can check out an interview we did with Karen on Dataversity.net about her upcoming presentation at the event. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. And hello and welcome. Shannon, you're awesome as usual. Thank you. And that was a lot of stuff today. And welcome, <laughs> Alec. <laughs> um, I'm so happy to have Alec with us today. And if you haven't seen him present, you have to add that to your data bucket list for certain. Um, he does such a great job of keeping people um, logically and physically involved in the subject matter, and uh, very much so. And, uh, I would just point out that he does Canada proud as he gallivants around the world talking data, process, and other kinds of interesting stuff. And sometimes, Alec and I get to be at the same event at the same time. So as some of you were hearing in the uh, early parts of this, um, Alec and I travel a lot, and so we're really in Canada at the same time. So this is another anomaly. We should both buy a lottery ticket, except what do what lottery tickets pay, Alec? Like $40,000, something like that? Uh, I guess Canadian. So <laughs> a little go. bit more. Yeah, so as Shannon said, we don't have a panel today. What we're going to do is have um, just a discussion with Alec and, and hopefully a little snarky a little bit of fun, a little bit of laughs, some serious stuff. And that means there aren't any slides, so don't bother asking why the slides aren't moving or whether or not you can download them. What you see there is what you get. But that means that you can focus on the chat that's going on in the WebEx. And in that chat, you can uh, ask questions and talk to all the other people logged into the meeting, which I really find is a value. Um, for our events that we have, as well as you can ask formal questions in the Q&A panel that you should see just below that. And, and I'll try to make sure that um, we get to those as well. Um, news is you can also tweet your insights or share some of the insights with the hashtag BCDmodeling for big challenges in data modeling. I'll try to keep an eye on that too. So uh, we're all sort of multitasking here. 
Um, today's theme about adding more value and being re relevant is something that I speak and do workshops on, and certainly Alec does. Um, even if he might not use those terms in his presentations, I know every time I've heard him speak, that really is his focus. Um, we're not covering, neither one of us covers, you know, here's just the theory behind data modeling or any of the other modeling or process flows or any of those things. Um, but I hear a lot of stories when I go out and speak or when people ask me questions or even what we see in chat of data modelers focusing on um, you know, that they don't feel like their teams value them or that their manager, management values them or that not all of them do. So that's what I'd like to, to talk about today. And the thing I want to point out is we've been hearing these stories for my entire career. And remember, my career has that 20-plus years because I stopped counting at 20. Um, <laughs> no, hey, 30 <laughs> plus. Yeah, kind of close to that, too. <laughs> but I'm just stopping it at 20-plus. Be thinking of backing it out to ten anyway, so just so I sound more relevant, right? Because we know old people can't do modern development, right? Is that true? No. Or is old just a mindset? <laughs> uh, what's what old is new again? I'm amazed That's these days true. at how full circle things are going. Anyway, you, you carry on. Okay. Sure, um, a question uh, looming in there. There is, but. The the one on this, okay, well, since I'm talking about old people doing this stuff for a long time, what sort of things are you working on now? Like what apps, not necessarily products or anything, but, but what constant things are you working now that you haven't worked on in the past? Well, I in with my consulting business, I'm always working on something that I haven't worked on in the past. So I'm going to be starting a, a job coaching a major genetic research organization. I recently did some process and data work for a traditional print newspaper that's uh, making a, a major shift into the digital platform world. Um, so there's always something new going on. But as I said a minute ago, I, I feel in some ways like the, the skills that I've been over 20 or 30 years are are more valued than ever these days. I think we've gone through, you know, if you look back over the last 15 or 20 years, uh, there have been any number of developments that apparently made uh, the modelers obsolete. I remember once uh, a client tell me, gee, Alex, we won't be needing your help with data modeling anymore. And I said, uh, why is that? And they said, well, because we're going client server. Really? Yeah, I remember then, that. Uh, yeah, a few years later, well, you know, it doesn't matter anymore because it's the, the, the eating of everything. This was in the late 90s. And then it was packages. We don't have to worry about that because, uh, you know, the, the people Waldorf have already done the data model. And then it was all sorts of, you know, and agile, gee, there's no time for data modeling. And inevitably, organizations get in trouble because they haven't dealt with the fundamentals. And some old dog like me gets called in to help her think about <laughs> And it almost always begins with data modeling. And as, as I always say, I, I don't tell them we're doing data modeling because then they light their hair on fire and run screaming from the room. But that's absolutely uh, what what we have to go back to. Just yeah, so what, are the, what are the central, what are the concepts, you know, what do we call them, how do we agree, how do we disagree? And I, I both at both at the genetics organization and at the newspaper, just building, spending 30 minutes doing a simple model of content. It's an eye opener. Yeah, so, oh my gosh, we've opened up so many questions here. So let's start with, since we're talking about relevance and value, why people run away when they're either we brought on a data modeler or, or I think we need a data model. Why do you think that happens? Yeah. Yeah. For the same reason I run away when somebody tells me I have a Six Sigma black belt. <laughs> and <clears throat> that's a, the most depressing introduction in the world. Um, and, and I think it's because just like people who've overdone it with something like Six Sigma, some day people they, they get a very narrow focus, and 
fault so much on data without putting it in context. How does how's our data model? And by the way, I'll just note that increasingly I don't as I don't call it a data model, but how does what we do support um, the discovered user stories in an agile environment? How does it contribute to developing better requirements? How, why is it essential to understanding business processes? So one of the most important things that we can do is um, figure out how to use our skills in these other domains. So I've been very surprised in recent years at how the agile teams are adopting some of the uh, some of the techniques I teach because they're because I'm putting them in context. I'm showing how this can how this can cut a lot of refactoring or refactoring as it's known, or how can uh, <laughs> can cut out iterations in in the cycle. So we get I don't like to use the word silos, but I think what worked for me is getting out of the data silo, and and that makes mm-hmm. my my data model techniques more valuable than ever. I, and um, can I can I throw in one yeah, more thought? And sure. Empathy. We have empathy. You know, we get so yeah. Uh, it's so easy to get focused on, on data and, and and forget that everybody else understands what we're talking about or shares our enthusiasm. I make the same point with business process audiences. You know, no one rule is, is don't. Don't ever forget that nobody else actually understands what a business process is. Ninety percent of people think it's the same as a procedure. And yeah. when we talk about data modeling, it's they understand that we're in this talking about a completely business oriented, or should be talking about a completely business oriented technical view of the domain we're in. Hmm. I mean, I'm, I, I I'm getting agree excited with you there. I'm, I, know. I'm like, I mean, I've got a monitor. <laughs> yeah, so that's me, right? I mean, that's what I talk about when I talk about in like so. One of the workshops I got coming up at EDW in Austin is, you know, it's about having enterprise data models for drive development projects, meaning contribute to them. And and right. number one factor there is this is not okay. First, you stop everything, and then you go do six months to a year to three years of doing an enterprise day model. And only then do you let developers do right. it. Like one of the hardest things, so I work on almost my projects lately are Agile and Scrum. They, um, right. they And most projects are troubled projects, which means someone has brought me in, just like you said, to say, exactly. my gosh, we started trying to get some data value out of our development, and it's not there. Can you help us? They're always like, yeah, and we don't want a data model. I'm like, it's okay. I'm going to do a data model because that's my tool and technique. I can do it really fast. I can be agile at it. I know the tools. It doesn't take me long, and I can deliver all kinds of value after after having written it down in this station. It works well for me. It might not work well for people who never done a data model, never used a modeling tool, but agile, right? Use the right tools use the right level of documentation, and they're like, well, we don't do any documentation. We're agile. And I'm saying, yeah, you do write things down. Well, you write it down in the code. Now we, yeah. now we drift off into uh, mag, uh, agile or fragile <laughs> misumptions. Uh, the, the agile manifesto say no documentation. Absolutely. Everybody misinterprets it. It says yep. we value documentation, but we value code, working code or work software where more, mm-hmm. but there's no value to documentation. Anyway, let me right. back up a bit. I, c- I couldn't agree more. We have to be able to do something in a um, time frame. And my, my, my current time frame is 90 minutes. If, if I can deliver something useful mm-hmm. uh, within a 90-minute session, then I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. Exciting the printer, practice. right? Fighting a printer, you get an extra thirty minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Or if you're, you know, if your WebEx isn't working. Oh, by the yeah. way, I do have, uh, you know, WebEx operating, which is why I'm signed in, but uh, yeah. I can't see any chat or anything like that. Oh, um, oh, it's probably there's so, a little globe. Probably there's a little globe app 
that you need to open up? Bob says I, I have to log into my account, but I have no idea oh. what my username or password is. So it would be your email address, but there shouldn't be a password. But anyway, I can when we I can help you screen for questions and everything. So okay, well, I thought I'd more. mention that uh, I can yeah, I I can monitor on Twitter. Yes, the, 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 the ability to do something in uh, you know without turning it into a boil the ocean endeavor, yes. without worrying about perfection. You know, my my official company. I mean, you know, is or motto is G E F N, which for good enough for now. Yeah. We use and done for now. We did, I used to ban <laughs> the word done because nothing's ever done in the business world right. unless you love up. So you <clears throat> done for now. Enough for now. I, Let's do this for now. When I was uh, working in Belfast uh, and I sh- shared my good enough for now. Um, and somebody said, "Oh, around here we use UBA." And I was thinking, "Well, gee, it's it's not the UBA," and that was ugly but adequate. <laughs> Sounds like a good uh, and a philosophy a for life. Post- yeah, that's right. And anyway, a few post-its and a few um, definitions go a long way. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think. Like looking back over my career and how we started doing the whole information engineering, and it was very, um, it was more iterative than how it was taught. It was still a lot of big upfront modding, um, and it was to build, to start documenting architectures from a very strategic point of view for a company, which is why it was that way. But most of the work I do lately isn't strategic stuff. I do have some strategic stuff, but because I've been stuck in these troubled projects, which means people don't really realize they're in trouble till they're trying to actually build something because I've been just floating along building UL models and and building code and they haven't tried to actually figure out what their data requirements are yet. Um, and that's why they can't get the answers out of the data they did find or <coughs> created or captured and their answers are wrong is that um, when, when, when I back though my the way I work and the tools I use and the the type of um, elements of quality have really changed over the years and and to if I went back to the nineteen early nineties me she would probably be horrified at this these small bundles of work that I produced and couldn't instantly map them back to a giant enterprise model. But as I come at it from me, it's not what my current project needs. Like my current project, like one of the projects I worked on had a million-dollar-a-month penalty for every month they were they late. I was going to pull off and start doing wow. a master data quality initiative and start aligning their business, uh, what were their BAAs, what were those called? <laughs> you know, to back to some strategic plan. That's not where we were. We were fighting a fire at a million dollars a month, you know. With the other value at some time when we've got the fire under control. I think you know I, that I, a balance. I'm doing um, yes. Uh, I'm I'm still supposed to not use the word but, but I'll say <laughs> yes. But I'm I'm still doing um, all these strategic projects too, mm-hmm. like the you know the newspaper. That was I mean that's a bet the business kind of initiative or mm-hmm. something I've been. Yep. Work on in higher education is is really strategic, and you still have to get people talking the same language. I just, mm-hmm. it, there's always whether it's something very tactical. Uh, I haven't done anything with a million dollar a month penalty, uh, better attention. But whether it's something very very tactical or or something strategic, I still. There's no substitute for for doing a concept modeling and getting people talking the same language. Absolutely, like the first step in world projects is to do that. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the if I look at the time I would spend uh, twenty years ago, twenty year ago, me uh, the time I would spend uh, analyzing over a data 
data model uh, was shock me now. Yeah. And lots of cases, uh, lots of cases, the work I do, people are quite happy not to even have me put my findings in a tool. Like I don't necessarily have to to, to put my process models into some BPMN compliant tool or my data models in, into into a tool. They're perfectly happy with photographs of the post-its and flip charts, the photos into a PowerPoint deck so they're easily transportable, and that's good enough. I think we've I, we've had I, that. We had a discussion once on Twitter, and I, I think from our point of view, that works. Where I find that works is, again, that strategic, more prize, more business-oriented reason you're modeling. Like when people ask me questions about, you know, the data model do this or do we need a data model, I mean, the first thing I have to ask them is, what are you trying to accomplish? Because, you know, when I'm a troubled project that's trying to build an actual functioning service or set of software, I need to build the models that can now generate DDL and do that. So if I just did right. the whiteboard or the napkin or the PowerPoint data models, which I've worked with the modelers on these, these troubled projects that produce a data model, use a data modeling tool, produce it, embed models in a Word document, and hand that over to their DBAs. And all of a sudden, their DBAs think they aren't adding a lot of value. <laughs> uh, Ironic, yeah. right? Yeah. So well, it really. Well, I. I think one of the we that frustrates a lot of people is we keep talking in terms of the data model, and I don't really think you know any more that there's one um, even uh, process model or business model or conceptual model. Those kind of have you just no one building architecture diagram. I mean, you build specific diagrams in the architecture, the physical architecture world, for different reasons. Right, and and I think that's where you know our our, um, our our recent experience would diverge. So I'm I'm not in cases where I'm expected to actually you know put something together that can transform into DDL. I'm I, yeah. I guess I am more often working at the at the more strategic end. Or honestly, most of my work is in large scale process change. And yeah, getting people. People talking the same language uh, is, yep. is a big deal. And right. I suppose well, and I those think, things are valuable, right? <clears throat> definitely. And that you know, going back to you know, how do we how do we add value to data modelers? I think it's you know, it, taking more of a marketing based approach and going out and looking for situations where. Uh, our skills will be uh, will add value, and you know one thing that I would uh, that I recommend to people. It's actually what I would recommend to people is that they read your blog from January <laughs> on seven tips for staying relevant and valued as a data modeler. Uh, oh, thank you. Just uh, I had to, I had to well I had to mention that because according to Shannon's introduction, you are esteemed, whereas I am infamous. <laughs> That's excellent. But there, there was excellent. there was a few a few things from that um, from that I that I had starred. You know, number seven, build a data modeling process that allows you to produce re releases quickly. I mean, in the modern world, speed is of the essence. So, if, yeah. as I've said, if you can't figure out how to do something useful, um, you know, a, a base an initial concept model with the you know short period of time, ninety minutes to three hours, then yeah. You really got to work on that. And you also said uh, get experience data modeling for integration projects and learn how to correctly reverse engineer application databases. So let me just dive in on that. Um, sure. It is a, a lot of value that I've been able to add, uh, or clients have told me I've added terrific value through reverse engineering. Building Go to physical structures, abstracting it back out to the logical model, and then up to a business-friendly concept model, and then that back to the business. And and not necessarily calling it a data model, as I've said repeatedly, mm -hmm. just saying, well, yeah. here is how your current application sees the world. And the usual reaction is shock and awe, or, or sort of understanding yeah. of, oh, that's that's why we hate it. 
So yeah. after my data modeling workshops, I, I always tell the participants the most valuable thing they do workshop is reverse engineer a conceptual data model out of the uh, uh, locations or systems they're working with. So you go in, you, you've had the same experience. We've been to a yeah. company and nobody has a business oriented view of the production systems. Yep. Which is pretty amazing when you think about, you know, new requirements, et cetera. How, how do you really assess whether they, that application is up to the challenge. So there, yeah. there's one piece of advice, and let me just dive in with another, and that is about how to use your skills in the world of packaged applications. Right. Because I have done a lot of work over the years uh, helping companies understand why hate the package they selected. And it virtually 100% of the time it isn't. It isn't the UI. It's not even you know the logic is going. It. It's a data model mismatch. That the way they see their world is not the, the same way the package sees the world. Yeah. I, I, the, uh, um, I guess we could also mention outreach. You know, like tonight, I'm doing a presentation for the IIBA here in Vancouver on concept yeah. modeling. Those a lot are of the business is, analysts, is, right? The business analysts, exactly. Yeah. I mean that. Who really can use these techniques? So we've really to do some outreach and show them in a practical way how just how simple this technique is. And an example that I'm going to be looking at in this presentation was uh, for higher education, when just a few minutes of concept modeling uh, in the um, management arena. Help me articulate a, a, a concept model or a data model for them, and it was it was a major concept in there that just was not present in the application they're looking at, and that's that's the kind of thing that people figure out game instead of early in the game, and would really help out in that in that arena. So, like, like do it, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that the, the package saw courses and classes as a two-level hierarchy, and yeah. the university saw it as a three-level hierarchy. It was, there was this middle layer that was the intent to offer a course to meet certain capacity at some point in the future, and that that concept just wasn't even in the package. And these wow. kind of things where we can really highlight these gaps in in view far more effectively than just being requirements. Asking people and getting 20 different answers. <laughs> yes, it, yeah. yes the, an, the analyst and the stenographer. Yes. Oh, yeah, we've had that one. So what I'd like to do is take some of the questions that I have in the Q&A. So one of them is, is, is good enough for now dangerous if you never get back to making it right? For example, siloed, redundant, or any of the other 10 biggest mistakes? Nope, not at all. Because uh, good, good, and no, nope. good for now is how you get people engaged, and, and uh, how how they start to see the value of this perspective. So I, I I guess I could agree if you never did make it any better. But the the point is, uh, good enough for now was like class set of stairs. You do it one step at a time. It'd be nice to leap to the top all at once. But, but we can't do that. So I think far greater danger in trying to get things perfect uh, too soon rather than doing something useful in the immediate time frame. Yeah, I really agree with that. And finding that balance is hard. You need experience. That's why most – I mean, this is the, the sort of the ongoing question for all architects and all designers, right? How do you know when it's good enough for now? That's the hard thing right. not through experience and with mentoring with other people. But I work with too many architects, especially data architects, who's trying to reach perfection, and they're losing their entire team because their entire team is moving on. And exactly. I, I, trying to trying to they're keep climbing them. The stairs. Yeah, they're climbing. And one of the great things about ways of doing things 
things is that um, it's about it has a disciplined approach to good enough for now. Is that you can put things in the parking lot and they get tracked, and then there's someone responsible for making sure we don't forget them. And you can report on this thing was taken out of scope, or we agreed to go forward with this defect, or use case Absolutely. edge case. And that's something we need to learn from the agile process. Is that yeah, it's a trade off. But, oh, my gosh, when, it's such a wonderful trade-off. Yeah, and when you get involved in, in, in a truly agile initiative, you realize, oh, this isn't like, you know, a, a lot of companies uh, adopt fragile as opposed to agile. Which it, it's just a nice term for quick and dirty. When you're in a truly agile environment, there's a lot yeah. of discipline and rigor. And I, that's what I wanted to, to talk about in the idea that good enough for now uh, – being being flaky. I, right. I I teach people constantly in my workshops that if you have a framework and techniques and you follow them with a degree of discipline and rigor, you can get a lot done in a short period of time. It's it's overdoing it, but it's not it's not flaky at the other extreme. Exactly. So um, the next kind is so that we've had a couple of these in chat and one here about. How do you reverse engineer a COTS product, meaning a package? And, and there's With lots. great difficulty. Yes, and that's something that's going on in the chat. So, of course, we can reverse engineer the database by pointing tools to it and getting pretty pictures of it, which, as some people point out in the chat, can be problematic because packages are usually highly generalized designs, right? So, Because they're trying to solve yeah. a data problem in the world in that space, as well as also designed by many different people over several years with not clear architectural focus. So there's usually a lot of duplication mm -hmm. and nasty data, data design approaches. Yes. Uh, it's hard, right? So in, in the sort of mid-90s, it was common for these large ERP packages to come with not just a reverse engineered data model, but sort of a logical data model of the package. And I think those have kind of gone gone away. I don't run into those anymore. I I haven't seen that. And, and sometimes it's I mean, it really is archaeology. It's uh, it, yep. it, you know I I coined the phrase systems archaeology 20 years ago to uh, well, I didn't coin it. I'm sure other people have yep. said the same I thing. But uh, I I've had at one time I have had cases where it was really simple because the vendor uh, had you know, just like a, a native SQL Server implementation, there was no generalization, and it was pretty easy to pull that back out to something I could present to the business. In other cases, you really have to do a lot of inference. It, it means getting a test version of the application and testing uh, behaviors, and from that, inferring the data model. That, and it's way more time-consuming. But it's it's really essential. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it, it, it is. Uh, you can tell the business this is where there's a gap. This is where there's overlap. I mean, I've had cases here in Canada where we had to point out that there was functionality in this large sort of HR system that actually was illegal in Canada due to the different employment laws. <laughs> and you know, and you, you kind of want to point that out. And they had a rule of we're not changing yeah. the package at all. That was a rule. And I'm like, well, you might want to change these few things because they're actually, and I know just a tiny amount about labor laws here, but it wasn't the obvious things that I know for sure aren't legal. And so, you know, it was examples like random drug testing and, and some early management things and some benefit things. And, and it's kind of like, gee, I think maybe you ought to budget some time for at least not jail. So your number one goal is to keep keep your CEO out of jail is a good goal for an architect. Uh, oh, I in the process world, I like to point out that you're uh, that what you're trying to do is keep the company off of the consumer affairs show on TV, <laughs> which we have some good ones. Um, you use the archaeology term. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I've had some interesting experiences lately where companies did end up in a very negative light on the Consumer Affairs show, and it was um, it was a business process issue. Yeah, yeah. Usually, right? Because that usually the process 
processes aren't completely automated, so they involve that horrible human factor, right? And it's all, you know, if we, I, it's, I guess, off the topic here, but my framework for looking at business processes is don't just look at the process design and workflow, look at the human elements like policies, motivation and measurement, human resources, and that's where things break. But another topic. Yeah, well, I once sent my bank, my former bank, two different process models for doing something with my credit card. I showed them how they had this, this most 16-step process that my other bank only had one step for me to do. And I sent that when I in my when I complained about they were having some issues legally with what they were asking me to do. And and then I point out how often I did get a nice letter back saying one's ever sent us the process model, and I'm like, you need more of this. I uh, I volunteered once uh, uh, on a customer service call that had been escalated a couple of levels. I volunteered to come down and map the company's process, and they uh, I think that I was serious, so they actually solved my problem. I need to hop on a plane for that one. So we were, we were talking about the world of uh, of COTS, you know, like reverse yeah. engineering. Um, let me just quickly relay a, a story. I've, I've written about this one before just to show how data modeling can fit into that environment. I had a company many years ago that was about to implement SAP. Uh, the business people, plant management, people called me up and asked if I could come out and do that thing I do, which which is music to the ears of a consultant. And that turned out to be data modeling. And wanted it. it was the last time I'd been out doing that, they all felt they understood their business better. And it turned out that because their CEO had told them they had to implement this thing called SAP, they thought it would be a good idea if they all got on the same page. So I went out, we spent two or three days building a conceptual model of their their business plant management, plant maintenance, and so on, and they used that as the framework, the the architectural framework for configuring, for implementing and configuring SAP. And they went, they said that was the most valuable two or three days in the entire project, and they became a global reference account for SAP because they had that integrating framework that only a good concept model can provide. So it, it was, yeah. this wasn't a case of going in and reverse engineering the package. This was a case of the business saying, here's how we see everything fitting together. We will not make any boneheaded configuration options that break this. And they didn't. Yeah. I think that's the hard part about these very large packages is one, they're so expensive and they cover such a, a, a wide breadth of functions, business functions, that not understanding, you know, that there are minor differences that you might be able to live with or these much bigger, larger differences that you need to identify early on so that you can find a way of dealing with it. If you're, like, I had a client that had a, you know, huge physical infrastructure, you know, spread all over a province, and they kind of handled the SAP concept of a site properly. Mm. And boy, they, they just paid for that for years. Mm-hmm. And yeah. honestly, just a little bit of concept modeling early on in the game would have, uh, would have shown how important that was. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, I mean, there's lots of stories about that. Like, so, you know, we the data profession, we should know more about sharing these experiences. I mean, I do this a lot at conferences like EDW, like Enterprise Data World. I mean, and that, that's one of my primary reasons to go to conferences like that is so that I can questions and stories and everything with Absolutely. people who are living in the same world I am and dealing with the same struggles. And, I, I mean, to me, that's the real value. That's why... You know, I don't think in-person travel to a city, you know, go eat conference food for a week. I don't think that's ever going to go away because none of these virtual things are going to replace that, even though I'm saying that right oh, in the middle no. of my webinar. But, but to me, that's the best thing. Why aren't, why aren't we 
doing more besides having enterprise data worlds about sharing this stuff? Like, I, I feel like our community does it the least. Like, we have very few bloggers. Yeah. We have very few people on Twitter. Why do you think that is? I, you know, I, I just don't get it. Uh, I, I wish I could answer, but I, it goes back to that word I brought up earlier, which is outreach. We just... Yeah. Uh, all I can say is, boy, it sure has worked for me. You know, when I built my free data modeling workshop, that was the first course I, I put together. And as, as you know, I education is a big part of my business. I, you know, I get four or five continents a year under my belt mm -hmm. delivering these mm -hmm. workshops. The first one I delivered uh, or developed was data modeling back in 1986. And yeah. I sat down and I thought about it before then, and I realized my audience was not data modelers, data architects, DBAs, data administrators, etc. My audience was business analysts. I needed yeah. to, to, to put together a data modeling course that would, that would help them do a better job. And I also, this sounds a little cynical, but that also meant that the potential audience for my shop was was an old magnitude or more larger. So it's worked yeah. out really well. And, you know, I think my my mission in life almost is, is showing people how, how these modeling techniques, whether it's requirements modeling or process modeling or data modeling, right. can, can really make people's lives easier. But we just yeah. got to get out of the – there's some value in things like EDW. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, this year. I I learn more at the EDW conference than at any other conference I go to. You know, it does a brilliant job of bringing yep. together different threads and disciplines. Uh, yep. I really, I'm speaking on data modeling for the IIBA tonight. I've spoken on data modeling at business process conferences. It's just something we need to do. I know, like so for instance, you know, I've been active again because I've been more focused on the physical side of modeling or the local and design side, let's say that. Um, you know, that's why I go and speak at SQL Server events or I'm gonna speak at Tech Ed North America coming up. It's because that's a whole new audience that has very little exposure to um relevant, valuable data modeling artifacts and, and why they need to do it. It's hard to for me to, to break into those because they all run screaming when they hear the word modeling and they think I'm going to talk about <laughs> first, second, third, fourth, fifth, normal form, which is not really what I talk about at all. I talk about really practical reasons on why people need to love their data. And, and to yeah. me, that's something yeah. we should all have in common. I think on, on that note, uh, well, two things. Uh, when I tried something along those lines, even EDW, uh, Tony asked me if I could is uh, once and uh, do an updated version of presentation called the human side of data modeling. Yeah. It's re, uh, just a whole bunch of techniques and, and case studies on how, how to get people engaged in in this thing we call data modeling. Uh, the other thing is I you know we're in the the age of, of big data you know social mobile yeah. conservation yeah. data. I if I have of the success when I don't use the word data because that just raises all kinds of assumptions. So I, 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 like I said, I don't typically call it data modeling. I'll call it, I often I don't even call it anything. I just do yeah. it. The old Nike methodology. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Uh, and you do that, you can get people engaged, uh, and when they're engaged and interested in contributing, then you, you can start to introduce some of our terminology and, and, and adding more rigor. So that's the saddest thing I've heard in all these webinars, and I so understand <laughs> where you're coming from. And and feel like, I mean, I have to resort to the same things, like when I show people on a project that I'm just trying to gather these, I mean, even saying the word requirements people hate because it's, it's a thing to do, and most builders don't like those things. Uh, do that work. And I say, no, no, the good news is I love doing this. It's frustrating, but I love doing this. So I'll take this job, you have a job of making it work fast. I'll try to hold you accountable for making it work right, and we'll work together. And, and 
you know, I don't want to run scripts on a database all day. I don't care how the SANS can be figured. I trust that you'll that you're passionate about those things. You know, yes. let's let's be a team. Um, I think though that you know, are we really just paying for the sins of all the data modelers and architects and process modelers and process engineers and all of those things because they couldn't figure out how to be relevant or how to explain the value and that we're having unequivocally hide Absolutely. who we are. It's so fair. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm not I'm not hiding who I am, but I'm I'm judicious with my terminology. And and let me let me point out, not just in the data world, in the business process world, there are many yeah. environments where I just do not use the word process or business process. Yeah. They, because people don't, they they just don't to see themselves in those terms or more than, uh, more than they've been burned, what you said, that we're yeah. paying for the spins of somebody else. So I, yeah. I often avoid the term requirements. Because business analysts have have uh, um, the endless list. I mean, I've seen I've seen documents with eight or ten thousand individual requirements. Well, yeah. I would disassociate yeah. myself from that. I would disassociate yeah. myself from people who are doing you know orderly, rigorous, and technical oriented business process work. So uh, I'll avoid those terms, just like I avoid data modeling as a term. Yeah. And I think, so the other term, so I grew up, I was a methodologist, right? That's the ultimate bad word, right? Especially in the Ooh. agile scrum world. But that really is still what I'm doing because what I didn't do was say, here are the 400 paper deliverables you need to make. This is what a methodologist does. It was helping people find the right tools, techniques, models, um, approaches that made sense for what we were trying to accomplish right now. And Absolutely. very few times was it ever all 100 deliverables. It was like, yeah. you know, I mean, and everyone needs note. to do a project charter, maybe not formally, but write down, here's our goal, here's how we're going to do it, and here's when we think we're going to have it done. The agile people will run me from a project charter, but they'll let me write down all the things in a project charter and say, hey, that was good that yeah. you wrote that down. <laughs> Precisely. So, again, the, the, the terms, you know, we, we've been burned by – by people going overboard with with requirements or process models or data models or project charters, we still need to do that. And we yeah. you keep coming, I keep getting into situations where people don't understand that there are, are the different levels of detail. So we've got contextual models, conceptual models, logical or detailed or specification models, and finally physical models. And there's a lot of fear out there um, with people who have only ever seen that detailed or even physical level of modeling. Yes. Yes. Up with it, we're uh, when we're adding value, we're up there at the contextual and conceptual levels. That's why I did a presentation. I think the first one was close to ten years ago, called the start of conceptual modeling, uh, which was my you know way of pointing out that in our field, people have People have lost sight of what a conceptual model is. I, I, I find the, the majority of people in, in the day field, mm -hmm. a conceptual model to them is just a slightly toned down logical or specification model. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, it's really, really radically different. Yes, and that's, we've made the distinctions over the years. I mean, initially we called it a conceptual data model, right? And now we call it a conceptual model to try to enforce that it's something quite different um, yep. than sort of the IE, the information engineering approach of it was just really your boxes and lines with no cardinality, right? I mean, that's really yep. how a lot, a lot of people taught it. And that was incorrect, but there was that. We have all the boxes really, were still there. <laughs> yes, or, or, or maybe there were only 50 of them out of the 300, but it was just some sort of subs of your logical model or something like that, right? So we have this big question in the Q&A is provide a recap of the value of data modeling. So go. The, the value of data modeling is that it provides a technology-independent view of 
of the business. And, and again, I'm going to push back on calling it demodeling. It provides a way of seeing the things that a business works with, the things that their processes and applications deal with. And that is uh, that that's a very unique and valuable perspective to be able to add. No, most of the time, people haven't seen that. If in, I'll, I'll, I'll draw a parallel. Uh, I did a process architecture for an organization lately, and at high level, uh, the high level of the process architecture absolutely thrilled the C-level executives because they had never seen a picture of what their organization does. They had seen pictures of how it's organized, but never what it does. A data model can accomplish the same thing. It, it, it's, it's a picture of what the things are that the organization deals with and how they fit together. I think that definition shows your point of view of what you've been doing. Because to throw in that the data modeling I, I do on like a project, I would do project specific, you know, getting to design data modeling as well. And it's a completely different mm-hmm. thing than what you just talked about. And I, I, I kind of circle back to where we started is that our own worst enemies because don't have a, a sort of commonly understood set of terminology and their descriptions. Like the DIA body of knowledge from DEMA tries to establish that, but most people don't have access to that and don't use those terms. And that's the hard thing. So what you said is absolutely true. And I do that type of data. As a matter of fact, I'm doing that with a client right now. One of the things that has pushed me, uh, not pushed me, but invited me back to the strategic data modeling and the more business-oriented data modeling is now organizations want to get into business and data analytics because they don't have this sort of common understanding of concepts and the data that they have right now and what they're going to need to get to the analytics they want and the answers they want. They realize that they have this need for not just enterprise-wide data modeling or logical modeling, but business models that focus on the concepts and then eventually get to the data. And I'm not going to call those conceptual models or logical models. I'm just going to call them models or analytical models, and we're just going to end up drilling down and then comparing them to reverse-engineered physical models and, and try to get them to get they need to ask the questions and find the answers, and just do that with spreadsheets. I think this is why your your point your blog. Can I plug uh, plug yeah. your blog once again? Absolutely. Point number three. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you'll share the link to it later on. Uh, get experience yeah. data modeling for integration projects. I, I how many times have. I've been involved in a situation where I had to show people that they're trying to integrate data from these disparate environments, and each of them has a different view of the world. And, and until you can demonstrate that, you know, an understandable picture up and say, well, here's how marketing sees the world, and here's how accounting sees the world, and here's how operations sees the world. And yeah. you, you, can't, you can't miss that they're all different. Is also with something I've done a lot with uh, when companies decide they, they hate the application they chose. It's really forward. Here's how you see the world. Here's how the package sees the world. See the difference? Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that... I, the one I, I really wanted to make sure I, I mentioned today, and that is I people, I've heard people for years say, well, how do I convince management that I need to do this? Or how can I convince this analyst that I should they should be doing data modeling. And the best decisions I ever made was twenty or twenty five years ago I decided to eliminate the word convince from my <laughs> consulting vocabulary. And, and I and replace it with demonstrate. It, it's a real cool uh, idea. But how do we yeah. demonstrate the value of doing this? Perfect. You can bang on people uh, you know with a big stick trying to convince them of something. It's real a lot less painful and more productive just to demonstrate. Me going and right. doing something real. But yep. uh, it's an idea that has served me well. Actually, good. that's a really good life lesson as well. Like you can tell people all you want. If you show them, they'll come along, right? And I, exactly. and I think that 
um, you know, I, I think I've blogged about this somewhere, but I definitely have told this story in my workshops about people, data modelers always come to me and say, how do I convince the developers that they need to use the data model? And that, that is completely give up on that. Just yes. give, no, give the DBAs and the developers what they're asking for. Now, that doesn't mean do what they're asking for, right? but if a developer or a DBA wants DDL, then be valued by them. You have to get them to DDL, even if you don't do it. If the uh, developer just wants you to go find out what the BIS means by double declining balance, in their depreciation requirements, go help them do that, right? The developer's not going to take the time to go understand yep. that. You go do it. But, um, and that's really demonstrating. But the other big thing is, is I tell people, focus on convincing the business people that it's valuable. And the business people will ensure, <laughs> yes, yes, demonstrate. But that's how you convince them. You demonstrate, right? So you're demonstrating yes. to the business users that it's valuable. They will make sure that the developers have the right motivation to to sure that you get the resources you need. And it's not just the developers, but it's IT management. I remember the time when a business user, you could see the light bulb going off in his head when I started a new project and brought all the models he had just worked on for another project. He goes, we get to reuse those? Yep. <laughs> so they're going to be a lot faster. Yep. Why he turns to the lead developer is like, why didn't you bring your models? And the developer said, but it's a new project. He goes, all the models, all those UML models we did, we're going to use a lot of those. He goes, no, no, new project. I don't want the burden of another project. And he's like, go get the models. So right. you, know, you, you want your users, your business people to say, where the heck are the models? And that's what I work on. And eventually, yeah. it all comes along. Yeah, Gosh, absolutely. So. So if I find just have faith. Do something of value, and you'll get your reward. And that is really the essence of our conversation now, right? You're going to be more valued and more relevant by being more valued and more relevant, right? By yes, acting exactly. that out. And up out of the weeds, and well, I, I guess I've made my point yeah. already. <laughs> I go there <laughs> again. Yeah. Do so you have any oh, other interesting questions lurking out there? Well, yeah, because we're getting close to the end. So what's coming next for you? Uh, we're working um, on, but are you doing some speaking? And you, you talked about tonight you're doing stuff, but, but what's coming up in the big picture? Oh, boy, I've got um, I've got kinds of things going on. I, I'm, I'm excited that I'll be doing uh, this concept modeling for the business analysis group here in uh, Vancouver. I'm also, I'll, I'll be back at Enterprise Data World. Uh, in April for the humans of data modeling. Yes, uh, I'm back. I'm down in Portland for the IIBA business analysis. There, this time I'm talking about um, going from process model to IT requirements. So it'll be a big chunk of uh, the value of data modeling in that. Uh, I'll be doing my usual business process classes uh, in various places in London and Helsinki. Did a big tour of Australia and New Zealand. That's coming up again. Mm -hmm. I, you know, actually, wow. I'm looking at my my speaking schedule, and most of the events that I speak at are business analysis events. Yeah, Maybe good. Speaking about data modeling and process modeling. Excellent. Doing my outreach thing. <laughs> That's good. I want us all to do more outreach. And I had I blogged on dataversity about. Um, our data architects and modelers are null in the blogging world, meaning they don't exist to the yes. world. And and so there's a good blog post out on Dataversity about that, so I won't take up time with that. And some of the things I have coming up, um, I'm going to be speaking at the Buckeye DEMA chapter, which is Columbus, Ohio, just uh, in wow. uh, early April, I know. And uh, I'm also doing a panel at the Business Analytics Conference in San Jose coming up. That's a past conference. Going nice. to Las Vegas, SQL Saturday, TechEd North America, where I'm going to be talking about uh, Hadoop and business intelligence and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, I'm going to do SQL Saturday Houston, which is right before TechEd. I hope I run into a bunch of astronauts there. Um, and 
Yeah, for EDW, which is coming up, um, if you're a DEMA member, you can ask your DEMA chapter for a discount code to go register. So that's one of the benefits of being a DEMA member. Um, and and I have some other SQL Saturdays and other events coming up. I've applied for a lot more. Um, I have some NASA stuff coming up. I'm so excited. Um, but that's bringing us to the top of the hour. So one of the things we do, Alec, is stay on afterwards. So we turn the recording off and stay on after maybe for about 15 minutes and try to get through maybe some more of these questions. Is that all with you? Okay. It right. sure is. So, can I, can I yeah. just give you one quick sure. piece of advice? When you sure. go to Columbus, Ohio, remember yeah. it's the Ohio State University. <laughs> and, well, and as a Boilermaker, you know, I might allow that. <laughs> and if you get an Ohio State University T-shirt, you can wear anywhere in the world, and people will come up and talk to you. Excellent. I, I, know, I don't know if that's allowed. I know this from experience. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, Dan, do you have some some amazing things? Alec, Karen, and Alec, of course, this was a great conversation. Thank you so much, and thanks to all the attendees, as always, for being so active and engaged in the conversation. Uh, I will turn the recording off here, and I, just as a reminder, I will get links out to the recording of the session, a copy of the chat that's been going on, and thanks to Alec and Karen for the many mentions of Karen's blog and to EDW. I'll make sure you have links. Oh, so here's the recording is shutting off, Karen.